Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to Hope at Home, bringing Hearts of Hope Family Grief Camp to where you are. Today, we're speaking with Joe. Joe, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi there. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Joe Morcom. I'm a school counselor at Totino Grace High School in Fridley, Minnesota. I've been a school counselor in education for 10 years, and I'm very thankful to serve in a few different capacities. One, I'm on our state board for the School Counseling Association. And two, an area I'm very proud of is I've been trained with critical incident stress management, which is also known as CISM. And as a result, we've created this sort of school collaboration where there's 10 area uh, schools, uh, private Catholic schools like the one I work at, who lean on each other through moments of crisis and uncertainty. So we get to have a network of support out there just like you are a network of support for so many families. Well, great, we're excited to have you here. Um, let's just get started. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between homeschooling and crisis learning? I know a lot of people are calling what our kids are doing right now during quarantine homeschooling. That's not necessarily the right term. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. Homeschool is that formal structure that has legislation, support, guidance, and resources. Right now we are in crisis mode, which is no surprise. However, when we're in this crisis learning mode, a lot of our efforts over at Totino Grace is yes, to move the dial forward, to provide some content, but truly, truly just to show care, consistency, and support that we're showing up for our kids, we're showing up for community, and that we're investing in who that person is. So it's important to note right now that, um, well, the world, not just our kids, but us and everyone else is in crisis right now. Um, so different things happen to your brain when you're in crisis. Can you talk about hap what happens in a child's brain during crisis? Sure. Uh, and truly, we are all experiencing a form of trauma right now, whether it's a real or a perceived threat of danger of your well-being, your safety, or even your life at times. When we're in that trauma, we're not thinking with this higher order brain that we've been gifted with. And we know our wonderful teenagers and even younger kids don't fully develop that brain until 25 years old. And so what happens is we go back into that reptilian, that real base sort of survival instinct mind, which is, I need to breathe, I need to sleep, I need to eat. And if those things aren't addressed, if a student is feeling unsettled, uncertain, again, real or perceived, learning is going to be incredibly tough. And so what our teachers sometimes find is that students who are typically really well adjusted on top of their uh, academics and organized are much more disorganized, their emotions are dysregulated, and they might present as if they're a kid with ADHD. And that's actually common. It's expected because we're trying to seek safety, support, belonging before we can access any higher order learning. So this is something that's common right now that you're seeing a lot of right now but it's anytime a kid's brain is in crisis so if there's a death in the family then their brain is in crisis any kind of upset like that could cause these sort of behaviors to present themselves without question this is one example of crisis or a trauma situation and so we try to gather and support around them to provide safety comfort support and then as we continue to do that attempt to in small measurable doses provide some education and structure for these kids. What, um, what are some of the biggest challenges to crisis learning? Well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so students are saying they're feeling overwhelmed in some classes. Uh, teachers are trying to navigate having appropriate expectations. So when it comes to that executive functioning of how can I take my thinking, organize it into a series of steps and lead that in towards a, a measurable, realistic goal, they stumble. And when they stumble, they get nervous. They see things like their grades might drop, their uh, sometimes attendance. It's harder to show up if they're feeling nervous or self-conscious. And when assignments don't come in, it creates the cycle sometimes of anxiety that can build because uh, their grades have been a, a success or they continue to sort of associate their worth or their strengths with their grades. And right now we have to be willing to accept as parents and our students have to accept that doing okay 
has to be enough right now. We have to give ourselves some grace, maybe a little extra grace as we navigate these imperfect times. Um, how would you recommend we support our students during quarantine crisis learning? So I, I think it is important that we put that face mask on ourselves before our kids and really give ourselves permission as parents and caring adults to slow down, to allow this to not be a time that we prove that all of the hard work we've done before needs to exist in the same way that it has in the past. It just can't. Uh, and so with that is allowing flexibility and imperfection as a parent. So that piece is critical for parents when it comes to students realize they're just, they're going to need more shoulder to shoulder help. The proximity and care of teachers that might motivate them and keep them a little more accountable is just gone. Uh, and so our teachers are feeling a little bit lost for that accountability piece and really working to partner more with parents on that. So a lot of my phone calls with parents, uh, one called me last week saying, what's the appropriate amount of time I, I should be nagging my kid to do their homework? Uh, honestly, I think kids are gonna regress a little bit and they do need things broken up into smaller chunks and a really helpful tool to approach that is protecting times at home that you talk about schoolwork. It helps a lot to protect a certain time. So I would say for high schoolers, one to two times a week and sitting with child and it's uncomfortable and they might not love it at first, but having them go through their grades, allow them to steer the ship and look through where am I at? What can I work on? Let them imperfectly create some plans and communication and then follow up at the end of the week or the next week saying, how did that go? And what worked well in really celebrating successes so if you protect times like that, one, it creates some ongoing consistency and accountability for a kid to prepare for, so lower stress and anxiety. And at the same time, it protects outside time so dinners can be joyful. You can talk about more fun things and just enjoy family more because uh, in the past, if it was an argument before school, they left, went to a different building, parents went to work, they kind of reacclimated to a calmer state of being, and then they came back and reconnected with the kid. While we're all at home, we don't have that same luxury to get out, to reset, and reinvest in ourselves. So really protecting times is important. I'd say one time a week as a starting point for a high schooler, two to three for a middle schooler, and it might be brief little everyday check-ins with that elementary kiddo. It's really easy to get into a place of thinking how long and when can I see my friend again? And what will happen in the fall and what will happen to businesses and what will happen to seniors thinking about college? It's natural. Please don't should yourself into not having those thoughts. So whatever you can do to just bring yourself into small projects, to get outside, it's okay to wave at people. Uh, it's, it's okay to uh, have moments where you laugh and joke. I know this is a serious time, but we have to come up for air. And reminders like that have really helped me kind of think about this is temporary and it stinks, but it's not always gonna be this way. I find that what, what helps me quite a bit in, in struggling with all of this, this uncertainty and this quarantine is, is gratefulness, gratitude. Yes. So one of the things that I'm most grateful for right now is that we are not rushing out the door to school every morning. My son sits on my lap and we queue up the Disney Plus and we hang out in the morning and I have my coffee and nobody has to get out of their pajamas if we don't need to. Nice. And, and I just try and be thankful for that every day. I love you it. Know, it's one of those things that we don't, nobody knows what they're doing. Nope. We've never done this before. Nobody has ever done this before. Teachers haven't done, done crisis learning before. Kids haven't done it. You know, parents haven't, like nobody knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and you make a really good point about that. Even when we return to school, it's not going to snap and go back to the way it was. It's going to take some time to build trust because there was no box in any of our minds for this to happen. Now that it has happened, similar to grief in some ways, then it becomes a possibility. It becomes a reality. And it's going to be natural for us to think about, well, if the flu season's bad, well, what could that lead to? So there might be these triggering moments where we kind of go back into these protective times where we have to slow down, break things into small pieces, 
and just focus on the person before the grade and learning. What are some behaviors that might mean a child would need extra support during this time? What are some things that we should be looking out for in our kids? Sure, I, and it, it's tough. It's not um, a hard and fast line necessarily because this is a time where we're all naturally going to be feeling uh, more than uncomfortable, but in moments we might feel unsafe or paranoid. Hypervigilant is a, a common phrase used in the psycho psychological world that anything that appears or could be a threat becomes the exact pinpoint focus, the laser focus of your day, of your frustration, of your anxiety. So when we see young kids, and in the school setting, we often look for common flags, whether that's attendance, uh, whether that's missing assignments, uh, extreme ongoing drop of grades, or behavior attitude shifts. All of those things, are okay to exist in a moment, in a day or two days. But if you're noticing that kids have uh, ongoing challenges with academic performance, um, frustration, managing emotions, uh, if they change their eating or their sleeping habits in a consistent way for over a week, I would say two weeks or more, that's absolutely a time to check in with support. Uh, I have students that are currently working through teletherapy and while that doesn't seem ideal, relationships can form in all sorts of creative ways. So don't give up hope on that as an opportunity. And it's so true that many of our therapists are very willing to have even a 30 minute complimentary consultation just as a starting point so you can investigate before you commit. So just because we're in quarantine and we've touched on this in other um posts, other videos, but just because we're in quarantine doesn't mean that we're cut off from help. You can have access to, to mental health help if you need it. So absolutely, more than just the hotlines and reaching out and having some unknown face and voice at the other end of the line, every day I get more emails and opportunities from area resources through therapy, through psychological assessment and services. So it really, it exists out there. And I think in some ways, the openings are a little more available right now. Thank you so much for your time today, Joe. Thank you everyone for watching. Remember, if you want to keep seeing these posts, you just hit that subscribe button down there. Um, and thank you so much. We'll see you all later. Great, thanks. Take care of yourselves.